ready for our second speaker today. Um, Christophe Galland from EPFL. He's going to talk about uh, some phononics instead of photonics, but hopefully <laughs> a bit related with the photons. Mm -hmm. Thank yes. you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I'd like to thank the organizers for this kind invitation to discover uh, Bristol and, uh, and all these other uh, people working in the quantum technologies. So I'm, um, so I'm Christoph, I'm at EPFL uh, here in Switzerland. And uh, so I've started my group there, uh, like as a junior group leader in summer 2017, so a bit less than uh, two years ago. And this was my, oops, uh, yeah, sorry. So this was my team uh, as of a few months ago. So what I will be talking about today are of do you control phonons? Uh, at the single quantum level. So what are phonons? Uh, you probably have all heard about phonons in your solid state physics class. Uh, and when I say phonons, I also mean also uh, vibrational modes that can be in molecular systems, so not like uh, extended systems. So this, uh, this, these are mechanical oscillators that you can consider as deeply cooled in the ground state, even at room temperature. And why is it so? Because they are uh, naturally, these um, frequencies uh, at which they oscillate are typically in the tens of terahertz. So if you do the math at room temperature, you have on the order of 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 2 uh, probability of, or let's say, average occupancy. So these are nice systems to test some ideas that have been developed in the field of cavity quantum optomechanics, which aims at controlling mechanical oscillators in the quantum regime. Uh, but this might also shed new light on quantum correlations or other quantum effects that could occur naturally in systems that are around us. So in the experiment that I will show you to you today, uh, we take a piece of, of a crystal, so it's diamond in this case. It's here at room temperature, we don't do anything, and we just uh, can play with lasers and create non-classical states of, uh, this, of the motion or the vibrations of the atoms inside. And um, so you, you, you have to forget about this idea that uh, these vibrations are like springs and, and atoms. They really behave as, as quantum oscillators with discrete states, and we can then also form pro, uh, superpositions of them. So with this, I'd like to um, give more generally uh, some of my motivations. So there are two main, two main uh, directions. One is to develop techniques that can allow us to control or to detect single quanta of vibrations, but also other type of collective excitations, such as pin waves or so-called magnons, and, uh, and explore this, uh, uh, these excitations in more and more complex systems and try to understand if quantum correlations can exist in some, uh, some materials that we, that we want to, to study. And the other one that I also uh, find quite exciting is when we go to uh, molecular systems, which even in a single molecule, so you have all kinds of different vibrational modes at different frequencies, and they're all coupled to each other. So you have a nice test system to study, um, in a sense, multi-mode optomechanics, where you excite one mode and look if correlations can develop with other modes. So these are general, general kind of uh, curiosity-driven questions. Uh, but as I will show you, there is also some hope that this could be useful for quantum technologies, since we are here talking about quantum technologies. And indeed, uh, more generally, with, uh, with cavity optomechanics, what you can do with mechanical oscillators, uh, you, you have several schemes that have been proposed, but one of them that has been demonstrated a few years ago uh, is frequency conversion in the quantum regime, so single photon frequency conversion. Uh, here, the mode that is being used is an acoustic mode that is confined by this phononic structure. Uh, it's at 5 gigahertz, so you have to cool this down to millikelvin or, or let's say, sub-kelvin temperature to really operate in the ground state. So this is the main uh, limitation of this technique, but it's, it's doable and, and, and people have done it. So I want to show that here, the, um, so the mechanical quality factor and the frequency of the devices that are written here gives a QF product of 10 to the 14. So this is a figure of merit that tells you how good your oscillator is in f for, let's say, quantum experiments. Because the higher the frequency, the easier it is to cool and to get rid of thermal noise. And if you just take bulk diamond, as I will show in the results of my experiment, you get a slightly lower mechanical Q at room temperature, uh, but with a much higher frequency, you are actually in a, uh, in a better QF product. And uh, there are even prospects of getting this higher, because you know, in diamond, you have a, um, a bulk system, so you have many channels for decay for oscillations. So 
In this case, we use optical phonons, and these optical phonons, they quickly decay into two acoustic phonons. As, so the, the lifetime is about four picoseconds, that I will show you. Um, but even like in the 60s, where people were playing with the first pulse lasers, uh, they could show that uh, if you just take dihydrogen in a gas, actually a high-pressure gas, it will take almost a millisecond to decay if you excite the vibrations, because there is no decay channel. Um, and, and recently, even molecules at the surface have shown to live for about 10 milliseconds active vibrations. So I have to say that here, uh, I don't think anybody has a clue of the clearance time of these oscillators. Well, so we know the lifetime. It's an upper bound for, for the clearance time. So these are things I, I'd like to explore as well. Good, so, so what is the, the, the approach for that? So I will use uh, laser pulses that are here. This, uh, oops, that's interesting. Uh, this, uh, okay, so now we are back to start. <laughs> uh, so these are these green and, and red things. Uh, these, these are short laser pulses. Uh, and they will interact with my, with my molecules, my phonons, whatever I put in my sample holder. And, and then I will detect scattered photons. And this scattered photon, I will use single photon detectors, as we have seen many times today, to make uh, strong projective measurements. The Hamiltonian, since, uh, since I'm supposed to be doing quantum technology, I will show a Hamiltonian. So it's, uh, it, it can be linearized in many cases and, and boils down to these two terms. Uh, so the first one here, so I put A for photons and B for phonons or whatever you have. Uh, this first term um, is the called uh, so-called stock scattering. So it creates uh, pairs. So it's like a, it's like a parametric down conversion Hamiltonian. So it will create a two-mode squeeze state. But here, instead of having two photons, I have one photon and one material excitations. Um, and so here, I will use a single photon detector to herald uh, the creation of this phonon, let's say. And then I need a readout step, which will be uh, created by this second laser pulse. And I will look at the anti-stox uh, photons that are in elastic lake scattered at higher frequency. And this, uh, this term, in a sense, is uh, mapping the state of the phonon. I use M for, for matter or mechanical mode onto the state of the anti-stox photon. So in, um, the, the question that I have to, to address now is, uh, so often we do this in practice, and uh, so we have to isolate a single mode. So if we work with a bulk sample, uh, if you want to do proper quantum mechanics, as I showed you, and, and address a single mechanical oscillator, you have to isolate one mechanical mode out of an infinity, basically, or quasi-continuum with different k vectors and uh, because of the dispersion of the material. So you have to do that. Uh, you have then to measure these correlations with very high time resolution, so even with the uh, jitters that we heard before about 20 picoseconds with state-of-the-art detectors, it's not enough. So you cannot just use uh, the detection time as a tool to probe the dynamics of the system. So you have to, to do some tricks there. And, um, and then uh, you have to certify that you are addressing single so-called Fox states, single excitation. That's, let's say what you want to achieve first is to create a single quantum of excitation. And after that, what I'd like to do is now to play with two two particles, so two modes, two phonons in different kind of modes, and, and engineer correlations between them. So as I said, we use uh, diamond as a, let's say, as a test system. Uh, it has a very nice optical properties and uh, a phonon mode at about 40 terahertz that is Raman active. So it's, it's an easy system to test our techniques. Um, and uh, it's, well, it's interesting also because it's a macroscopic phonon that we are looking at. So it contains really hundreds of billions of atoms uh, in coherent motion. And I have to acknowledge here, so I'll show you here why we use a single mode fiber. I have to acknowledge also the uh, pioneering work of the group of Jan Walmsley, who was uh, in, Ox uh, in Oxford, I think, at the time, uh, who did some first measurements on this phonon in diamonds using different techniques. Um, so we, are, we have uh, actually improved by more than an order of magnitude on this result. And this allowed us to do new measurements that were not done before. So just to, to walk you a bit through the steps uh, in more details uh, of, the, of the experiments. So we place our diamond here uh, between two objective lenses. Uh, and we use a single mode fiber in collection. And that's important to detect, uh, to, to isolate a single special mode. And then we send these uh, two steps. So we have this right pulse, the first ultra short laser pulse coming from a model lock oscillator, uh, in which we will have this spontaneous uh, stock scattering process. So after this interaction, in fact, the state of the phonon is not interesting. So it's in a thermal state. If you, if you discard, if you lose the information about what happened, because it's a probabilistic process, 
um, the statistics or the distribution of the chance of exciting a phonon uh, in this Fox space is like a thermal state. But when you detect uh, this photon, you project out the vacuum and then you get to good approximation of Fox state like you would do to create heralded single photon out of parametric down conversion. But now you have an, addi an additional challenge which is to recover this excitation. So a photon is not much energy, it's, uh, you know, it's 100 MeV in your sample here at room temperature, it won't last forever. So you have to uh, quickly send a second pulse, uh, which I call the read pulse, and then watch uh, this uh, anti-stocks process. So you see here that I use two different frequencies so that the stocks of the first pulse and the anti-stocks of the second pulse are spectra spectrally distinguishable. And this is what is essential to be able to multiplex the signal and send them to different detectors so that you can get arbitrarily high time resolution, I mean, given by the pulse duration, basically. So when you do this, you can then map out the state of the phonon on the anti-stocks photon. And uh, so to summarize, this is a setup that we have built uh, with my first student, uh, Santiago, who did most of these experiments. So we have a mod lock laser pumping uh, an OPO, which is frequency doubled. Uh, and this gives us the write and read that can be delayed. Uh, so we use a bunch of these tunable filters so that we have full flexibilities on the, on the wavelengths. Uh, so it goes through the sample. Uh, we can check, of course, on the spectrometer. And then I will just focus a bit here on the detection uh, because the detection is the m one of the most tricky parts. So what you want to do, so this is the spectrum that you get typically. So here you have your laser. Uh, so let's say it's in wavelengths. So you have this first pulse uh, that will spontaneously create the stocks band here. So these are stocks photon coming from this first pulse. And then the readout pulse is here, and it creates the anti-stocks here. So here for the spectrum, we cranked up a bit the power of the anti-stocks uh, laser. So you want to isolate these two things. So you first block the laser as best as you can with these first filters. Uh, then you split these two signals uh, using this tunable filter that is on, a, on this kind of uh, rotation stage. I mean, it's like a retro reflector. So when you tune your filter by tuning its angle, you still uh, get the same path for the beam. And then we have additional uh, band pass filters to, to really get rid of all noise. Um, and then why do we use two detectors on each path? So it's important to first characterize uh, the autocorrelation function of each field separately. So the stocks field and the anti-stocks. So what do we get when we do, uh, let's say the measurement here of the stocks? So in this experiment, I just send, let's say the first pulse I look at these uh, stocks photons that are emitted through this uh, kind of parametric down conversion process, and I look at their statistics. So if you remember your quantum optics course, uh, this is what you should obtain. You should obtain a G2 of two, for the same reason as, the, uh, as I said before, is that if you forget information about one of the two modes after the parametric process, the other one is in a thermal state. So this is indeed what we see, but it's, Important to see that because it tells us that we are indeed accessing, uh, addressing a single mode, single spatial mode, single temporal mode. Otherwise, it's very easy to lose this because it goes as one plus one over n. So if you have two modes, you would see 1.5. So it's, it's, not, uh, it's, it's not the case here. So that's a good uh, first check. If we do this on the anti-stocks, for a slightly different reason, we also get uh, a thermal statistics. But here it's maybe easier to understand because the phonon that we probe so here we don't, have the, uh, we don't have the right step, we just look at the anti-stocks alone. So in fact, we are probing the thermal state of the phonon. So this residual, residual thermal occupancy that we have in our sample, we just convert it to an anti-stocks photon, and then we can characterize its autocorrelation function, and, and we get something close to two, anyway above 1.5, again, it's important threshold. Uh, but here the noise is a bit more uh, pronounced, I mean, the signal is weaker. The noise is the same, but the signal is, is, is weaker. Because here we, we, we haven't created a, a phonon first. It's just a thermal uh, statistics we are looking at. So now we can combine these two things. So we have addressed this first question that we are sure we can address single mode of this uh, bulk phonons. And now we want to see if we can measure these two time correlations. So for that, uh, this setup is actually even simpler because we now use only one detector per channel. And we have um, a nice inequality that tells us that once we know this autocorrelation of these two fields separately, if our oscillator is a classical oscillator, or if we describe the experiment with classical physics, mm -hmm. it should 
respect this Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, so the cross correlations between these two, once normalized, cannot exceed uh, cannot exceed this uh, the square root of the product, which in this case would be about two. So what we see when we perform this experiment, so this is uh, it's not normalized. These are the row counts uh, coincidences per minute, but anyway, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is this bound. So you see that by you know, several, um, at least more than one order of magnitude and many standard deviation, we, we are above this limit, so it's, uh, it's a clear indication that we are in the, in the quantum regime with this, with this ponent. And uh, we can now play with the delay between these two pulses, and as we increase it, we see that the uh, amount of coincidence we get is dropping. Uh, so these are, let's say, accidental coincidences between different pulses that gives us uh, the baseline. And as we do this, we see the drop in, uh, in the coincidence rate or in the correlation function that we can summarize here. Uh, and we can then clearly see that this uh, phonon lifetime here is decaying over four picoseconds. Uh, so this was nice because we, we knew from other experiments that this should be on this order. So we, we could be sure that we are, we are not measuring something else. But uh, so that's a good thing. Uh, and here is the threshold for the classical uh, bounds. So it's actually uh, working very nicely. So this was published uh, last year in PRL. And then I wanted to, to go a bit further and, uh, and really check that we have created this fox state that I wanted to, to create in the first place. So if I come back, so yeah, that's the second checkbox. If, if I come back now to this experiment, I told you that after detection of this stock's photon, I expect my oscillator to be prepared in a good approximation in, in a Fox state. So I want to, to prove that. So what I want to do now is to do a hanbury brown and twist uh, interferometry measurement that is conditioned on the uh, success of the first step. So, so this is what we did. And uh, so it's a bit more challenging now because we have three detectors that need to click together. So it's a threefold coincidence measurement. But it worked very well. So once we see these correlations developing, when we look at only two channels, we see exactly what we expect, which is uh, an anti-budging, or, or more precisely, a sub poissonian statistics in the, um, the anti-stocks field condition on this click. So we have, and again, it decays with uh, the dynamics expected from the phonon lifetime. So we, are, we, have, uh, we have done some projective measurements uh, projecting the phonon in a Fox state, and then we see it decay, and uh, it recovers to the thermal statistics, or at negative delay, it's, it does a G2 of 2. Uh, so yeah, so that's um, that's basically the um, single phonon control creation of creation and detection of single phonons. So uh, this would be interesting now to do it on, on on different system, of course. But I want to show you what we are doing now, uh, which is not yet uh, published, but we we have very interesting results. So now that we can address individual phonons, can we start playing with correlations between two different modes? So that's what you would do to, um, I mean, now the lifetime is too short, but if you wanted to entangle phonons in different places, you would do that. But can you already do it with what we have now, which is a single sample with a piece of bulk diamond? So you could have, you could imagine several strategies in order to do that. In the end, you just need to create two different modes. And the one I chose is to use, um, so what you want to do now is to go from this simple experiment to one where we probe some kind of entangled state between two, uh, two vibrational modes. So the one I chose is so-called uh, time beam entanglement, which was developed, uh, as far as I know, in the group of uh, Nicolas Giza in, in Geneva. It, it's a very robust form of entanglement that has been used successfully to distribute quantum, uh, to di distribute key uh, through QKD over rather long distances. It's actually also the type of entanglement that, uh, since you, you mentioned it before, the, in this experiment from, uh, uh, from Ronald Enson, where they entangled two diamonds, uh, they actually used time beam entanglement in the first place to, to encode their, uh, their state. So what is the idea here? So if you look in space-time, you, uh, you have light traveling uh, you know, at the speed of light. Here you have the sample position. And in the first experiment, we had the right pearls creating a vibration and the red pearls detecting it. Now what we do is we split. Um, or pass, and we delay one arm. So we split both the write and read pulse, and then we create a copy at a later time. Uh, and to give you an idea of the time scales here, uh, if, you, if you were to scale up the, the phonon lifetime to one minute, uh, then these two times would be about, uh, about by one day. So it's like having a phonon living for one minute today or one minute tomorrow. 
But now you want to erase this information. Uh, so what will you do is you just fold this interferometer. So you delay the path that was a short one and, and, and vice versa. And, uh, and then here, if your beam splitting or if your splitting ratio is 50-50, you know that you erase the information on which path uh, the uh, excitation took place. So, so you will erase this information and that's, in a sense, you can map this to a kind of Bell measurement, although here there is no known locality because things are, are local, but it's still a Bell state that you can create. And Alice and Bob can then tweak the splitting ratio in the sense of this uh, interferometer. So when, uh, when we did that, uh, that's what we got. And uh, well, it's not yet published, but we, we are working on that. So we, we do see a very nice actually violations of Bell inequality persisting over, you know, five, six, seven picoseconds. So we don't have yet a full theory to, to fit this curve. I mean, we have some theory, but we would like to, to be sure about it. Uh, but again, as expected, it seems that the, the main cause of, uh, let's say there is no pure dephasing in this system. So the phonon lifetime is what limits the coherence time of, of, the, of the Bell state that we create. Um, and that's, uh, that's more or less wh what we can do now with, uh, again, with the same type of materials. So what do we do from there? Well, um, so we have addressed all this, of these bullet points on a, on a model system. And uh, so this paper was published in PRL. This one is, uh, is on archive. I forgot to put the link again. And this one is, uh, is not yet uh, out anyway. Um, oh, good. Ah, okay. Uh, so I went too fast now. <laughs> This is up, okay. So maybe, maybe it's fine. I'm sorry for that. Yeah, I think it's okay. Good. Uh, no, it's, uh, yeah, I need to do that. Good, so, so um, I think what's, what's interesting to do now, on the one end is to look at systems where you have, as I said, many vibrational modes. So we we'll just take an example of thiophenol, a simple molecule that we, that we use in my lab as well. Um, these are a few modes, there are many more that are Raman actives. And, uh, and now we can adapt our scheme to do several things. One thing we can do is to excite a Fox state in one of these modes, and then watch over time of other modes get populated and of correlations are built between these two different modes. I think that's an interesting thing to do because it's, I don't think it has been measured so far. Um, another thing, or it has been measured by the different techniques not looking at quantum correlations, uh, another thing we could do is to prepare entangled state now in, in, in frequency space. So if you use a pulse that is short enough, you can erase information on which uh, of these two modes was excited. And this is something that also has never been done. Um, and as I said before, you can also look at more like condensed matter systems where you have other type of excitations and, and try to see if these techniques are, are working. Uh, and also do things like quantum frequency conversion using uh, these phonons or, or mechanical oscillators. Uh, there is another part of the work that I'm not showing today, uh, which is related to the cavity part of cavity optomechanics. So what I showed now is has no cavity involved. We do it in, in free space. Um, but we are also interested that um, seeing of, uh, of, the, of light can, so you know in cavity optomechanics you can use light to, to cool or amplify mechanical oscillators. That's one of the big, uh, kind of goal of, of cavity optomechanics. So in principle, you can see the same effect if you trap your molecules inside a cavity that is small enough. So now you have, you have oscillators that can decay very fast. So you need to drive them very hard to see the similar effect. So you need to scale these uh, things, everything down. And one of the effects that we, so we, we place these molecules uh, on a gold substrate and form self-assembled nanocavities. Uh, and there now what we want to see is as a function of the detuning of the laser with this cavity, which are very broad, so you need a very broadly tunable uh, system. It's, it's quite hard to, to let's say, um, to calibrate. But after that, we would like to, to do some precise sideband thermometry and see of the uh, temperature of different vibrational modes is changing as a function of the excitation wavelengths and, and power. And uh, in principle, we should be able to observe uh, both quantum and dynamical back action, which are two types of, of effects happening in, in this regime. Um, so, and there are other interesting physics related to the fact that all these oscillators are now coupled to a single cavity, the same mode of a single optical cavity. And in principle, they should be able to, to synchronize due to the feedback of the cavity. So these are simulations I did a while ago, but 
you know, just with uh, kind of optimistic parameters, but you, you, you can, I mean, that's what you expect to see. So if you have inhomogeneous broadening in your system and you drive it uh, on a blue detune uh, uh, of the cavity, at some point you should see some kind of synchronization and all oscillators should oscillate in phase. And these are systems that, you know, where this could be observed. Uh, not sure it's possible. Uh, so before concluding, I'd like to advertise a conference that I'm organizing with a colleague in, uh, in Lausanne in, uh, in May. It's about diamond photonics. So I also have an, another PhD students working now on uh, NV centers and more like say conventional things in diamond. Um, so we are organizing the f what we think is the first conference only dedicated to diamond photonics. We have a very nice panel of uh, invited speakers and you can still register. So abstracts in principle is the uh, submission is closed, but okay, we, um, if you write me, we can maybe do something, but otherwise please register and just uh, come to attend. Uh, so with this, I'd like to thank my team. So Santiago did most of these experiments. Uh, Michel was a postdoc also in the, in the beginning. Um, we have support from theorists. So actually Vishek is an experimentalist, but he's uh, very talented in theory as well. So he's, uh, he's helping us in some papers. Um, Yes, and uh, these are my, my team. And I want to mention also that uh, despite that I enjoy, uh, in, so uh, I enjoy very much Lausanne and EPFL, but uh, it's not so clear if I can, you know, pursue my ERC project over there. So if you have, a, if you think that this research could fit in some other institution, please uh, contact me as well. <laughs> and uh, with this, I'd like to thank you very much for, for listening. Does anyone have uh, questions for Christophe? Alex? Ale oh. Thanks. Uh, really, really interesting research direction. Do you have some ideas of whether you could work in systems or have ways of extending the lifetime of the phonons? Because currently the lifetime of course, the phonons is, is quite short. Yeah. It would be nice to have a much longer coherence time. So. Yes, so, so I think what I showed in the beginning about, uh, I mean, definitely in the, in the condensed matter, in condensed matter system or in crystals, um, I don't think you can do much. I mean, I, I, I want to, to look at other systems and I've heard that some systems have longer lifetime. So I want to look at these crystals to, to check that. Now you will always have many different modes into which you can decay. So I think the route is clear is you need to take relatively simple systems, so molecules that are not too, too complex, and isolate them from any uh, bath. So either you do this in a, in a gas phase, or, or as I showed you, even if you do it on a substrate, in this paper they used uh, um, sodium chloride as a substrate and a crystal. And then you have some kind of natural, let's say, phonon band gap. You, you, you have just a bottleneck. And there are these CO molecules, they, they cannot decay, so they just emit infrared photons and they can live for, let's say, 10 milliseconds. So, so which is, I think, a really, really nice um, lifetime. But again, I don't know the coherence time because probably there is some dephasing due to some process there. So w what would the dephasing be? Because you often think in, in normal systems, mm -hmm. it's the phonons that cause dephasing <laughs> of the photons. Mm -hmm. So what, what, is, what would be the pure dephasing mechanism of a phonon? Well, I mean, I think in gas phase, clearly you have collisions. Collisions where the energy might not be lost, but uh, probably the phase is, is, uh, is scrambled. Um, now if the molecules indeed are fixed on a substrate, um, it's a good point. I mean, uh, I, uh, it would be great if they, if they are coherent for that long. Uh, yeah, I hope we, we can, I can tell you in a couple of years or so, but great, yeah, uh, yeah, thanks. for now I don't know. Yeah. Super cool talk, thanks. Uh, what would be required to start coupling these like phonons to say defect centers, um, maybe electronic states or something like that? Mm. Uh, so, so what the question precisely about that? Uh, uh, how do you do it? How would ah. you be able to do it in your system? So, man, if you take a defect, it's naturally coupled to localized phonons. Uh, and I don't think people know much about them. Also, I think recently people have measured using some, some other techniques, estimated their lifetime, and it seems to be also very short. Um, but you have also systems that are maybe more interesting where um, if you take even like a 2D material or a nanotube or things like that, uh, all excitons are, are 
naturally coupled to, to many different phonon modes. And uh, this it could be uh, it could be an interesting system to, to study all of these two interacts. Um, I mean, there are several things we I'd like to do in this direction, also related to the last part, to cavity optomechanics. In principle, you can use excitons as a cavity, in a sense, because they provide a resonance, so they can break the sim or let's say uh, uh, change the ratio between stocks and anti-stock scattering, and so you can e even cool or amplify phonons using excitonic resonance that are coupled to them. So this is more the direction I think is interesting in this case. Thanks. One more question from Josh. Yeah. Thank you. Really cool stuff. Um, I wonder. I may have missed it, but are, are you able to estimate the efficiency of coupling your, you know, coupling foot on foot on foot on? Yeah, it's very low. <laughs> so it's very low now. I mean, we, we don't have. We do it in free space. I mean, we have a good collection efficiency overall. I mean, it's on the order of 10, 20 percent. I mean, including detection, because we do this in a, you know, in this kind of uh, transmission geometry. It's a single uh, mode, so this. This is quite good, but the process itself, the Raman scattering process, is, is, is not efficient at all. So um, for the right step, it's a good thing because you want to stay in a regime where this happens uh, quite, I mean, with small probability, otherwise you create two full-on state and you have problems. For the readout, I think right now readout efficiency is maybe 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4. So it's not good at all. And this would require a cavity to enhance it or using system with larger uh, Raman cross-section. Yeah. Okay, so let's thank Christophe again. Thank you very much.